Thank you. Thank you, Tuffy. So, uh, I'm not going to steal your joke about the self-driving talk. You want to start us off there? <laughs> yeah, we were offered a moderator, and I think that in the spirit of uh, autonomy, we, we decided to go autonomous. Yeah. So we'll moderate ourselves, hopefully successfully. Yeah, it's, it's a very ancient concept called the conversation. Let's see if it works. Uh, Thanks, Noam. Yeah, well, you're welcome. Um, uh, maybe, Ron, if you introduce yourself, I'll, I'll introduce myself, and then we can sort of get into it. Yeah, I'm uh, Ron Agam. I work for SAP, recently acquired um, a company called Signavio out of Berlin. And uh, we're really kind of preoccupied on how enterprises, large organizations do stuff, what we call business processes. Um, and I think there's a larger concept within SAP called the intelligent enterprise. You know, is there such a concept and what does it mean? And we coined phrases like time to insights and time to adapt. And um, I think this is how this uh, right, uh, like alternative reality came about. You know, is, it, is there such a thing as an autonomous enterprise? Yeah. Uh, and I'm Noam. Um, I work for Palantir. Uh, Palantir is a, a originally Silicon Valley company that moved to Denver uh, just a little while ago um, with a, a very, very strong global presence. And, and basically, we help very large enterprises understand what's going on in the world, what's going on in their own world, and then make better decisions based on the data they have about what's going on. Um, and I run our public sector practice, which means uh, all of the work we do in, in government, whether that's supporting defense and intelligence or uh, healthcare, uh, borders, uh, financial oversight, all that kind of stuff. And, and, and have been spending a lot of time uh, thinking about you know, what decisions in that setting do we automate? What decisions in that setting are always going to be the purview of, of humans? And so um, as Ron and I were, were talking about this talk, we, we, we stumbled on the, the concept that really we, we talk a lot about in technology about autonomous driving and autonomous cars, uh, and that captures a lot of imagination. But, but um, you know, what does it mean for the organizations maybe we all work in and for the governments that, we all, uh, that, that run the states that we all live in? What does it mean for those organizations to sort of uh, get on the path to autonomy so using, using that same metaphor? And so that's, that's what we want to talk a little bit about today. Um, and, and Ron, you know, you, you've thought deeply about exactly that question, so maybe kick us off with, with what do we mean? Yeah, so, so I think both of us have kind of a, a focus on large organizations, right? And, and treat them maybe as an organism. And the holy grail of an autonomous enterprise or a government is, a, hey, Siri, reduce emissions by 10%, and that's it, right? So that, that kind of organization <clears throat> have all the means to drive an autonomous uh, business objective or, 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 or policy objective. Um, and obviously, that's, we're not there. And the analogy that we want to use a little bit is, is the car industry because we're all starting to feel it. We know, you know, what's, what, what kind of car are we driving, what kind of autonomous cars we have in front of us. And we do make the distinction, right, that there's, there's, there's discrete autonomy, right, measuring distance, making you stop, and that's one concept. But there's an autonomous car which actually makes decisions, right, day or night. And that's what we're shooting for in terms of our vision, right? Something that's really more than just a specific function that can be automated or, or, or made autonomous. Yeah. And, and I think it's, it's uh, fascinating to see the, the artwork that we just saw that I found tremendously compelling in terms of like, okay, well, these are sort of big problems, right? Whether it's pandemics uh, uh, or decisions about how many guitars we should have in our world because we appreciate creativity. Um, and, and so the, the idea here is, can the enterprises we work in or the governments we work in uh, t tackle that type of question without a tremendous amount of human intervention? Basically, can a, can a car get us from A to B without a, a person having to put their hands on the wheel? Um, and, and I guess my question to you, Ron, there is like, is that achievable? Is it desirable? And, and how far away from that are we? Well, so I mean, humbly, I'll, I'll try to, to, because from the vantage point of, of what we see with the organizations that, that we work with, um, and I think that, that we, we can really look at, at um, you know, the stepping stones towards taking a very discrete function and making it very automatic, even, um, you know, doing much better than humans, like, you know, when you answer the call center, what's the sentiment of that customer? Um, and that is not the same as taking a, what we call in, in our industry in order to cash a capability of a company, which is, which is made out of literally billions of events and making that an autonomous decision. It's, it's very different. So I think there's a big difference in, 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 in these two objectives. Um, and we see a lot of organizations that are trying to capture 
right? The entire operating landscape. And to me, that equates to building your own map, right? So the car industry and the, the analogy that we're using is, is, is still preoccupied with high definition mapping to be able to put the car in the right context. And so what we do with some of the organizations is, is we see if they want to build that map of the entire landscape, then you get a step closer into, into that vision. But today, you know, asking what are the state of the art is, is, is possibly, you know, data, connectivity, plumbing, massaging, labeling, you know, and then something breaks again. And I think a lot of, a lot of what, what we do with our customers at the end of the day is a split between the human factor of discovering, you know, how are you doing things to basically trying to extract data and manage it. And, and it, all the systems have data. It's just, can you really access everything at scale and immediately? And that takes time. And this is where I think we still are. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's uh, putting the engineering hat on, you know, Steffi, the, 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 uh, uh, this conception of like discrete stuff and that being very automated and automatable and, and, and we can set our engineers on it. And then like what happens when you bring all that together and try to make a system that, that can make decisions. Um, I think the pandemic uh, was really interesting to watch from that perspective, right? So we were very involved at the NHS in the UK with the response there. And um, it, was, it was interesting because at the beginning, there were these models of how the disease might develop that were developed by Imperial and other places. So you have like a bunch of conceptions around, okay, well, how is this disease gonna spread? And then there's other groups working on models for, all right, if a person is sick and comes to the hospital, how long will they be there? What resources will they consume when they're there, right? And then there's a, 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 sec, or a third group of people working on models for you know, uh, how all the inputs of that. So like personal protective equipment like gowns and masks and oxygen, how that gets consumed by something like a hospital. But those things have nowhere where they come together Right? And so ultimately, a decision maker in the end is, gonna, is trying to say, I want to keep as many people alive as possible. So I want to make sure that the right, the right hospital has the right oxygen, um, that we have the right personal protective equipment so we keep our staff safe, all of these things. But to do that, you sort of need to bring all these things that are actually quite good in a discrete way together into one environment, which, they, which the NHS actually in the end was able to do, which is really cool. So in the end, what you were able to say is, OK, well, this is how we believe the, the, the disease is going to spread. And ultimately, this is where we're going to move the oxygen around. Um, and then they were able to take that sort of set of learnings and put it into a vaccination campaign to be able to say, okay, can we even model human behavior? People of, of different uh, uh, ages and demographics take up uh, information in different ways, and we expect that they'll show up at the centers in different ways. And so actually make good plans for making sure that there's vaccines and nurses and syringes in the right places to give those doses out. Um, and so you started seeing the emergence of actually a reasonably autonomous uh, system where the machine is actually able to understand how we think this phenomenon is going to develop and get sort of vaccines into the arms of, of people. So I think we're starting to see like the beginnings of this actually emerge. And I don't know if you're seeing that in the, in the corporate space as well. So I think it's, it's the, the company really decides to kind of large scale, you know, let's say data engineering to, to make a, a system more proficient. We had a different view early on in the, in the corona where we had a lot of hospitals, obviously in Germany as well, trying to just figure out how do they change their triage mechanisms, right? And they actually, you know, had to design new processes at, at a localized, right, area like you have a hospital and then you have like people coming in for accidents and you have people coming in with corona. Right? So that was a big occupation of actually designing um, you know, a new way to approach things, a process. And I, I would have to think if an autonomous entity would, would have to make that kind of decisions on its own. Because uh, I think there was a lot of, you, you could see when they were designing this, there was a lot of care for, for humans, for things that I don't think we have, let's say, modeled correctly in, the, in, the, in, the computer, in, in, in computer science. Yeah, I mean, and this is really interesting. So we, we run into these challenges all the time where we have all these bright engineers uh, that are working on problems. And so now, again, at the NHS, uh, post, or, you know, now that we're dealing with the, the after effects of the pandemic, we have these big queues of people that need to be cared for, and in particular in surgeries. And so uh, can we increase, the question now has been, can we increase the number of people going through surgery uh, to, to deal with this backlog? And so we tried lots of interesting machine learning approaches and artificial intelligence approaches to doing this. And it turns out that the most effective thing one can do is to give a surgeon a very good list of these are the people you are supposed to treat tomorrow. These are the problems they have. These are their medical histories. And let the surgeon decide in which order they should, treat, they should take those patients. And if you do that, you increase throughput through the operating theater by 30%. 
So it's fascinating to see like what you do if you if you're able to put the data into the hands of a person, you're actually much more effective right now than if you put that data into the hands of something like an AI or an autonomous system. Right, and, and we have also a kind of a commercial example that's become my favorite is that, that we always, like when we go with, with, with companies, usually it's about you know, efficiency and, and, and getting capacity in line, et cetera, and doing everything faster. Um, and so uh, we, we got this great example with working with a bank that, that, that um, you know, when you go and get a personal loan or, or a home loan, you perceive it as about you know, the, what they call the customer journey, 10 steps. But the underlying uh, operations in the bank is 700 steps. So they had this whole improvement factor going really, really deeply. And then what they've learned at the end of this is that some customers that are denied immediately a loan are dissatisfied because they feel that they were not considered. So, I mean, no autonomous system, if it's not given the right objective, would actually design for customer satisfaction where basically if you don't, um, you know, if you cannot get the loan, you actually wait a few days before you get the, the, the response from the bank. Otherwise, you really feel that you need to go and, and go to another bank. And, and I think this is where we're not there yet, right? This thing is, is, is not really happening right now. Yeah. No, and I think it, it's, it's interesting because what you're getting at is sort of like how do you, if you're thinking about autonomous systems, you think about self-driving cars, we have a pretty clear conception of what we want them to do, right? We want them to get us from A to B as safely as possible. Uh, and, and so it, there's a pretty clear sort of set of, of heuristics around what, what it is that we're building. But as we design these autonomous systems in government or in, in, in enterprise, um, what it is we're building and what we're optimizing for is actually incredibly important, right? And these are the conversations we don't normally have. Like we, we have them on a philosophical level around com like commercial enterprise. Like what is a company for? Is it for its shareholders? Is it for its stakeholders? Is it for its employees? So, but in like an autonomous enterprise, who is it for? Right. And, and I think, you know, we, we also wanted to touch base a little bit of what would be, I mean, I mean what would be interesting? I mean, what should I do in a, in a certain setting, be it a government or, or, or an enterprise? How do we advance this, this future to where we want it to be, which is another question. And, and then we talked about a few, a few things that, that, that can be done today. For example, you know, I look at, at what I call the age of observability, right? Do you have observability into, into your... Your, your government or enterprise. And I think a lot of it is not just the data acquisition. Is it, is it an insightful enough data? Is it comprehensive enough? Does it represent all the things you want to optimize for? Right? So for example, if you're not optimizing for customer experience, you're going to get great autonomous enterprise, but all the customers will move to the uh, competitor, right? Or, or, or the citizens will not be happy with, with this e-government uh, construct. So observability, I think, is, is one of the greatest things that, that, that we see that we can do today, right, to kind of hoard the data in your organization, make it available, make it observable, and, and then that's one of the steps to, to advance that future. Yeah. And I think that, that, you know, leaves us with a lot of philosophical questions also. When we, so in, in my world, I, I work a lot with, with public health agencies and, and, and those sorts, but also with like military and defense and intelligence. And at the end of the day, we're getting into some very interesting questions about, you know, who makes what decisions in these sorts of systems? So like, what kind of a world are we moving into? And the thing to think about there is who do we, ultimately it becomes a question of who's designing this system and how much do they believe in, in uh, certain values or certain people, right? Um, and so I ask the question myself a lot when I'm hearing all this, the, the, the metaverse conversations, for example. It's like, well, do I, want, do I want to live in Mark Zuckerberg's metaverse? Do I want to be in Elon's self-driving car? Like, the people who are designing these systems have a, have a really important role to play in sort of like how they, how they developed. Um, and as a sort of an American living in Europe, a big part of my question is, you know, what, what is the European perspective on these things, right? Where, uh, you know, we have the American uh, engineers and companies that philosophically are behind a lot of these movements. Um, the question is the European sensibility in this. Like, what, what is it, what is a, you work for, for a European company. Like, what does a European company think about uh, design in, these, in, in this kind of a world? Yeah. And then I feel it as well because I'm kind of, uh, you know, I've lived in a few places and I, and I sense that there was some conversation about also the, the you know, the German or European ecosystem of, of startup and tech. And, and I feel that there's a lot, of the, a lot of the things that I felt in the Silicon Valley 20 years ago, I feel in Germany. I mean, I, I run a team and, and it's, everybody's from a different nationality. Uh, everybody is right. There's a, a kind of a melting point um, idea, but, but there is a unifying factor, you know, 
especially with what's going on in the world right now, that you do want to have some ethical constraints um, to, to this organization. And also, I think um, what we call, and, and, and it was said, I think, before as well, uh, you know, the augmented employee. So instead of just looking at an autonomous enterprise and really thinking that everything is about uh, making a whole organization work well, maybe we flip it around and we, we, we look at an augmented uh, employee information worker that can actually um, work in a better environment, in a more productive environment, and, and not necessarily kind of uh, go to work and the boss is the autonomous enterprise. And I, I guess it's like, if we're mapping forward to some sort of world where there is a whole lot more self-driving in government and self-driving in, in companies, um, it, to actually to, to Steffi's first initial intro here, how many of your kids are engineers? Or, or how many of, of you want your kids to become engineers in this world? Very, actually very few, which is really interesting. Uh, uh, and if we're in a space where, where uh, engineers are going to be making a lot of these decisions around like what basically, like what kind of companies do we work in and what kind of, what kind of uh, world do we want to live in, it is really interesting, right? Do we, we have a lot, I have kids and, and none of them are going into engineering. Uh, they're all going into creative fields. And that says something interestingly about sort of, you know, are these systems going to take over without the people that we really care about uh, designing them in the right way? All right. And we had, the, I think, the, the last kind of bit of it was because um, we asked ourselves, okay, so, so, you know, you can have automated actions and you can also have, you know, like autonomous enterprise that create new processes and new, and new concepts. And, and there's an example for good creati creativity by, 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 you know, by computer systems, by newer networks of, of symphonies and poetry, et cetera. <clears throat> and then we asked, I mean, but what's the optimizing factor? What do you want to get out of that? And that's <clears throat> a creative notion. And I think that often in governments and in large enterprises, the, the objective to optimize for is not necessarily creativity, right? Because then you, you possibly mix it too much with ethics, et cetera. So you, you actually want to do something else. Yeah. Well, uh, I appreciate this is more, more questions than answers, but um, I think we just wanted to leave you with this, this conception that you know, we are on, our, on a path to a lot more automation and autonomy in the, the, the enterprises we work in and in the, the, the companies we, we work in and the societies we live in. And the people designing those systems are incredibly important. Um, and uh, you know, we're a big part of that. The companies we work for are a big part of that, but, but so are you. So I think being highly opinionated about uh, what are the values in these systems is, is incredibly important. So thank you so much for your time. It was great to be here. Enjoy the rest of your conference. Thank you, Norm. Okay.